No, mom. <laughs> That. Jump side. That's my nice hair. Cindy Cody. Trini Good morning, Devin. Good morning. I understand you're not feeling well, so you stay on mute and we'll try not to uh, have you do any kind of singing or anything like that, okay? Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. A long conversation about that. Um, and I said, we agreed that that was all the mistake uh, made some time ago. Um, Let's convene February 8th Youth Justice Oversight Committee. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah. We have a few people that are unable to attend uh, that are Zooming in. We have a few people that may be in and or out because of, of there's something going on in the state house. Legislature's in session, so uh, we'll try to accommodate people coming and going um, for our meeting today. So we'll convene. We need to take roll call. Somebody have the list? I do. Uh, Stephen David here. Steve Balco here. Cirilla, yes. Shannon, yes. Terry, yes. Judge Dolahanty, anybody seen him? Nope. Nope. Okay. I saw him. But Gracie's here. Magistrate Foley's here, correct? All right. Judge Graham's here. Mary Kay, the Mary Kay Hudson is here. Devin's via video. Nicole? Here. Yeah. Nancy's here. Joel. Joel may be tuning in via video. Oh, there he is. <laughs> My intel's not very good. <laughs> James C. Wilson. James? He's on Zoom. Here. All right, James. Are you in, um, are you out in Vegas for the Super Bowl? No, I'm not that rich yet, so I'm kind of stuck here in Indiana in the cold weather. Uh, Kia? <laughs> Kia is? Kia is coming in the door. Mm. Yeah, in the hallway. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say I don't. He is. We'll we'll, chill, we'll count her. Vicky's Judge Carmichael's here. Excuse me, uh, Doctor Osma. No, he's unable to be here. I want to say um, Director Stigden. I was gonna say the other Terry, the bad Terry. No. Judge Broadwell. Judge Broadwell. All right. Is that everybody? I miss anybody? Good. We certainly have a quorum. We'll convene. Uh, another robust agenda. Let's look at the minutes. They were previously distributed. Anybody have any corrections, additions, changes, styling changes with the uh, minutes? Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, sir. Is there a second? Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, James. Paulo, Devin, uh, put your hand up or down if you, otherwise we're gonna assume you're okay. Um, all those yeah, opposed, good. good. Mm -hmm. All those opposed say nay or, all right, unanimously, unanimously passed, great. Again, robust agenda. Um, gonna lighten up, let's go around very quickly. Uh, tell us if you want to share what your, New Year's, one of your New Year's resolutions is, okay? And we'll just do this quickly, just kind of loosen up instead of getting them to do exercises. Please Julie? remember to use the microphones. Julie, <laughs> we'll start with you. Hey, that's exactly right. 
Um, one of my New Year's resolutions is to simplify, buy less stuff and throw out less stuff, particularly food. So you do that by starting a new job, right? <laughs> okay, great. And everyone knows next Friday is your last day. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought there was going to be action filed in the federal court to <laughs> seek an injunction to prohibit that, but apparently not. So unfortunately, Cirilla? I didn't make any resolutions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, to finally have chickens this year. <laughs> On the garden thing. Yes, I will bring eggs. Oh. You'll regret that. Yes. <laughs> to try to actually go on vacation this year. Mm. <laughs> Find you a senior judge. <laughs> judge? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Admit, I don't make New Year's resolutions either. I'm a Cirilla. Mm -hmm. There's somebody over on this side of the table that's seated next to me. I think is the same philosophy. Mm -hmm. Judge? None? No. Nope. Okay. Well, I do. I, I'm undertaking what I call Project Alamo, at least a mile outdoor every day. Tried it four or five years ago and got sidetracked by an unexpected surgery. They won't let you go run outdoors when you're under anesthesia but this year i'm, I'm hoping to make it so far so good damn those rules <laughs> that's exciting that's cool that's cool we hope you're please do that good morning microphone. i had a um, microphone oh, thank you i turned that way i thought that was good enough mm -hmm. um i had a new year's resolution but it's february and it's already gone so i'm done for the year <laughs> same <laughs> My resolution was to sleep more. Mm. <laughs> we'll start that next month. <laughs> Mine was to say no more when people ask me to do things. Um, it's February and that hasn't happened either. <laughs> uh, mine was not to disappoint my wife and, and be able to summit the mountain. And I wasn't able to do that. So she didn't do it either. Um, but we had a great trip and I, I just got altitude sickness and, and that's all manageable. But when you, when you can't breathe uh, and didn't realize that until you get up there. Mm -hmm. But um, so I'm going to stop making New Year's resolutions. I'm over one. Mary Kay. Uh, mine is to drink more water. I wonder where that was going. <laughs> mine is to usually make New Year's resolutions, but I have been trying to eat healthier. So I guess that's. <laughs> Mine was to go someplace new this year, and I got it accomplished pretty quickly because I got to go to San Francisco with my husband, which I'd never been, so it was great. Excellent. Uh, mine was to plan more motorcycle trips, and we have three on the books. Yes. Mine was to just be more present wherever that is. Nice. Better work-life balance. <laughs> Amen. If you can yes. that. James, any resolution for this year that you want to share? Less work, more time with self. Devin, we'll give you a pass and catch you next time unless you feel like talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, so I don't make resolutions, so I don't really have anything to share either. Very good. Any staff members present want to share? We'll ask our, our guest speaker. Uh, we're going to jump right in with our our. our Featured guest presentation, uh, sort of an overview on screening and assessment instruments. And, and this will be relatively new information for some, perhaps a um, refresher for others. But we have um, Dr. J.C. Barnes from the University of Cincinnati, go Bearcats, and Michelle Goodman, the Michelle Goodman, is going to tee this up. So. The presentation uh, is in your hands, Michelle, in your hands, doctor. Thank you, Justice David. Thank you, uh, members of the Oversight Committee. Um, I'm appreciative that we were able to set time aside on today's agenda to have this overview discussion with all of you. Um, as you know, 1359 has the requirement that Indiana begin to um, use validated screening and uh, risk assessment instruments. Um, and it's foundational to all the work we've been talking about and all the work we're asked to do going forward. So we wanted to make sure you had a good um, understanding and overview of some of those basic, inf basic information about the tools. 
And so we thought that having Dr. Barnes here to do that for you would be uh, much more effective and efficient than uh, myself talking. But to give a little bit of background, we've had the youth assessment systems. It's called the Indiana Youth Assessment System. It's a suite of tools, not just one tool. Um, I think we shortcut things sometimes when we talk about the IAS versus the many parts of the IAS. So um, there are a suite of tools. They are validated and um, evidence-based, and they've been adopted already by the Judicial Conference, which is another requirement that 1359 sets out about those tools that they have to be adopted by the conference. Um, in implementing those several years ago, um, we did so for multiple reasons. Um, we had a multidisciplinary work group um, that made that recommendation to the conference um, but the basic reasons are to help improve our implementation of evidence-based practices, to help with individualized case planning, to help with state-level data collection, training, and research. So a lot of the same themes of things that we're talking about in this oversight committee as well. So I'd like to take just a quick moment to introduce Dr. Barnes. Um, J.C. Barnes is a professor at the University of Cincinnati. The University of Cincinnati is the creator of our tools, um, but they continue to work with our jurisdiction and others on these tools and other projects related to evidence-based practices and risk. Um, Professor Barnes teaches classes, but he is also the director of the Criminal Justice School. So if you guys could welcome him, I'd appreciate it. Hey, is this, let's see, adjust this. Yeah. Is that okay? Great. Okay. Yes, Thank you, Michelle. That was fantastic. Uh, New Year's resolutions, start there. I think that's a great way to kick <laughs> the meeting off. I'm gonna use that in our next faculty meeting. Uh, I think, I had, I really had one, but then I heard someone else say something that I'm like, I'm going to steal that one too. Uh, so my, the one was to try and lower the LDL cholesterol a little bit by uh, eating a little less candy. Uh, so I'm working on that. And then the second was, yeah, take more motorcycle trips. So I'm with you. Maybe I'll see you on the road. Uh, so thank you, Justice David. Thank you, uh, members of the committee. I am extremely honored to be here when uh, Michelle uh, extended the offer. I uh, jumped on it. This is the type of thing that uh, folks in my position, I, I think, don't take advantage of enough, which is reaching out and, and talking to people in decision making capacities uh, about, you know, at a state level like this, at a, at a large scale. Um, and so when I was thinking about what I might present to a group like this, and Michelle gave me a little briefing on kind of the, the collection of folks who are here and the, the level of uh, background maybe with the IAS, the Indiana Youth Assessment um, System. I, you know, there were, there were different ways I could go. We could get very technical about some specific things that might be on your mind. Um, and I'm happy to go into that. Uh, if there is something specific about IAS the, or risk assessment more generally the, that concerns you and you'd like to talk about. Um, but I ultimately decided not to go that way because it sounded like there might be some folks who maybe are roughly familiar with the tool or with the idea of risk assessment, but but don't have the, the direct hands-on knowledge. So I wanted to try to kind of, make, at the risk of, you know, then saying nothing at all, I wanted to try to appeal to the kind of the, the middle, you know, and, and, and hopefully give something for everyone. Uh, and so... With that being the mission, I think it's important to put risk assessment as an enterprise in the context of, of what it's trying to achieve uh, and what it's trying to achieve from like, you know, someone who might be on the side of creating a tool, but also what it's trying to achieve for an industry or for a state level partner or agency. Um, and ultimately, that that goal from both perspectives, actually, is trying to predict the future. And, and that's, as we know, an extremely difficult thing to do. Uh, and in this case, specifically, we're trying to predict future behavior. And that turns out to be one of the hardest things to do in the world. <laughs> but these humans are incredibly complex and we, they make decisions that almost never you know, line up with what expectation and, and sometimes defy logic. And so... That doesn't mean, though, that it's impossible to predict a group kind of phenomenon more you know, better than chance. And that's that's essentially what risk assessment is trying to do. It's trying to predict future behaviors among a group of people in a way that could get us get a, get a better prediction than if we were to just flip a coin, which, as it turns out, the, a coin flip is about as good as we can expect if we were to use even my clinical judgment. If I were to take any specific case file and read it, even though I know what to look for, 
if I'm just going off of my gut reaction to that case file, it turns out I'm, I'll only be right about 50% of the time. And we see that across the board, no matter how much expertise and experience uh, someone might have. Of course, there's variation, but that's about the average is even someone who's an expert in criminal justice industry, you know, whatever that means to you, uh, that 50% is about what we see. And so you, you start to then think about, well, how could we, what, what can we do to improve that? And that's, of course, where the, the risk assessment enterprise got started. Um, and just like anything else in behavioral or social science, the, when, and when you don't really know what to do, you, you look to other fields and see if they figured it out and see if we can steal ideas from them. And as it turns out, there's a, there's a really massive market and industry around prediction that we can, kind of, that we can pull from. And that uh, the Super Bowl remark earlier kind of mm-hmm. kind of hinted at that um, it is not impossible to predict group level phenomena better than chance. And of course, the shiny casinos uh, in Vegas and and the casinos that exist in Indiana are evidence of that fact. They're as it turns out, they're not built on the backs of successful betters, mm-hmm. right? And so. You start to you just kind of take from that logic. So how what what's what is the what's the goal? But then also how how are they putting together predictions? And so in this case specifically, we'll think about like sports betting, for example. So again, the Super Bowl was a, a nice uh, a nice foreshadowing. Uh, I took a look at it actually earlier uh, earlier this week because I, I wanted to use an example that maybe wasn't safe from the medical field, although they are great. Uh, uh, parallels to risk assessment in the medical field. The LDL cholesterol uh, is is one of them. Um, as it turns out, when Vegas sets odds on Super Bowl uh, on the Super Bowl, if you were to just bet what's called the money line, which is basically pick the winner, uh, had you done that for the last fifty five Super Bowls, you'd have been right about somewhere between sixty and sixty eight percent of the time, depending on what which odds maker you went with, uh, and. As it turns out, that's right about the prediction accuracy that we see from validated risk assessment tools like IAS. And so, you know, I don't want to say if it's good enough for Vegas, it should be good enough for us. But <laughs> you know, that's not the point. We're getting off in the in the weeds here. Uh, but but that's the mindset: is that it's ideally we'd be able to predict what any individual might do tomorrow, and and ultimately that would be the goal. But what we see and what IAS does as a system is it allows the state to be more efficient with resource allocation. It allows us to make better state level decisions about how to treat uh, clients who have a certain portfolio or a certain background. What's most likely to be successful for people like this doesn't mean that any one individual should should that there shouldn't be departure. You know, and that and that's actually something we can talk about is that uh, the IAS system specifically. Uh, accepts and and allows for additional information to be to be used and and uh, and departures from the the scoring itself and, and departures from those decisions, but outs, absence you know some very key or critical information uh, that's often not necessary. So I wanted to uh, kind of with that as our backdrop, give some specific maybe get into the weeds just a little bit on what it means to say IaaS is evidence-based, what it means to say a tool is reliable, what it means to say a tool is valid, because all of those things overlap, but they do mean slightly different things. Those terms are are unique. And so to say that something is evidence-based means that there has been, there's been data applied to either putting that tool together and hopefully over time, continuous quality improvement. So this is what happens and actually Indiana's uh, right, right there at the end of a of a revalidation of IAS, uh, and our team is is a part of that. But so when I say data, I mean, what does that mean? And when we're when we're talking about individual behavior, that means we 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 need there to be a specific kind of checklist, almost if you will, uh, a rubric that. If we were to give it to each person in this room and give you a case file or present you with a client, the ideally we would fill out that checklist the same way. Um, it allows for some variation, but 
if I scored it, you know, whatever, it doesn't, the number doesn't mean it, but if I gave it a three, we would hope that almost everyone else in the room would score it at a, at a three, you know, and, and any departures, you know, could be, would be things that maybe we would uh, quibble over. So the data on any one checklist like that, or on any one assessment instrument can then be collected across thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of clients who have been given that checklist. This is what IS does. Uh, and then we can, we can use those scores to then see how did, did they predict something in the future? Did they actually predict uh, recidivism uh, or did they actually predict a higher risk of recidivism to be more accurate? Um, and so the evidence based side of it comes in from all of that data, all of those inputs being we, you know, crunching those numbers statistically to then find, do, do those inputs pr predict a higher risk of the thing happening that we're worried might happen? Um, and of course, I has, has been through this, that that's what we refer, refer to as validation. And again, that's the evidence-based. Um, and a validated and reliable tool is one that both can predict fairly well the outcome, but also the reliability that we would score it the same way. And so reliability means consistency, you know, across cross score or across context. And I think that's a really, both of those are extremely important concepts to, to keep in mind when we're thinking about something like this, uh, predicting the future. Um, and so in closing, uh, and then I, I welcome questions, I welcome uh, you know, feedback or, or uh, nudges to go deeper into any topic that I've hit on, or if I completely missed something that you're hoping to talk about. But I think the, the last thing I wanted to emphasize is the importance of doing something like this, a prediction instrument, and again, trying to predict future outcomes at scale, at a scale on, uh, of, of, an, of a state. Uh, a scale of a county, cross county, um, because what that means is getting getting any one prediction wrong. There's a cost to that, right? And, it, and there's a cost to the client. There's a cost to the state. There's a cost to the system on either end, right? Because so we can get it wrong on the 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 positive end that we thought someone might offend who reoffend who didn't. There's a cost to that because perhaps maybe more resources went into that person than was needed. And the other, if we get it wrong, you know, false negative, uh, failing to predict something that actually then does take place. And so the with validated risk assessments like the IAS, the whole the goal is that it's the we've never sort of won the game. It's it's an infinite game in the sense of over time, continued improvement in those predictions, and as concerns come up, uh, and one of the one of the big concerns right now in the risk assessment world is, of course, uh, the potential for bias across different um, different groups, you know, in the community. Um, and so, being being able to address those, to being able to see those with data, but also them trying to address them by adjustment is is all part of the game and all part of all part of the the idea. Uh, because we can't address it if we don't have data on it. You know, if, if it's if it's knee jerk reactions or clinical judgments that are causing the bias, that's much harder to address than saying, "Oh, it's this item on the risk assessment. Maybe we need to remove that or change that one out." Um, and so, again, I'd just like to close by saying thank you for having me. I, I welcome any any questions at all. Um, you know, try to stump me. Uh, those are those are fun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate that. Uh, questions. Director. Thank you so much. Um, I'm intrigued and I have a lot of okay. questions. Um, so um, uh, first of all, how long has the system been around? Oh, that's a good one. Um, Michelle, do you need to answer to that question? It's 10 <laughs> plus years, right? <laughs> so um, when Indiana embarked on adopting the IAS, we had a multidisciplinary work group who worked for several years before we made the selection. We looked at various tools across um, the country that we're in place. Um, so our work with the university started in 2008, and that work started for their team to come to Indiana and to do the initial uh, validation study on some of the larger um, portions of the system for us. It was originally developed in Ohio, and so we brought that over, and that team did the initial validation work for us. Um, those research reports are on our website. 
Um, but after doing that work and working with our multi multidisciplinary work group, we also partnered with our technology team to set up the electronic database to collect all the assessment data. So we were never starting with paper and pen to aid with that data collection so we could further research in the future. Um, so it went live for users after training um, that's required um, in October of 2010. And where is it used right now? So it's used in um, all of parole, all of Department of Youth Services, all of probation and community corrections. Statewide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to, had to defer. <laughs> no, yeah, use your resources. I suddenly look like I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yes, Judge. Judge, and then Judge, and then <laughs> Judge Graham. So, so often um, I hear in my courtroom from various persons um, the term screening, screening tool versus assessment evaluation. Can you comment on what is the difference between the two and what this is designed to be? That's a great question. So like many uh, complicated endeavors, I think there's a the I, I as but just risk assessment more generally suffered from kind of a lack of uh, marketing, you know, and public PR uh, thoughtfulness up front. And so had that been the case, there might have been a, a, a much more concise language and specific terminology. In a general sense, a screening tool and a risk assessment tool are basically the same thing, uh, but they may, in specific contexts, refer to different types of tools. And so, and again, that was where I think that would be uh, just poor marketing and poor, uh, poor thoughtfulness on the PR team. So it could be the case. And so what I mean by that, that they might mean different things in specific contexts. So there are different tools for different parts of the criminal justice system and the decisions that are, can be made at different stages. And so on occasion, I, I have noticed that um, that maybe maybe we call it a risk assessment at, say, uh, you know, some sort of release decision point, but maybe it's a screener tool at, at some other decision uh, point. Um, ultimately, though, the goal is the same but the the inputs might differ. So and and this makes sense, right? Like we might need we might think different and actually we would rely on the data to tell us if there are different things that matter as a predictor for this outcome, say, um, you know, uh, misbehaving in, in a correctional context versus risk of recidivism, you know, when released to the community. And in fact, there are different types of predictors. So um, I don't think you can get too. I, I would. I would risk. I wouldn't get too caught up in the the language and more on what is this tool trying to predict and at what point in the process should this each tool be used. Is that hopefully that's helpful? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Brunel. I have a question. A few minutes. And then can you also talk a little bit about? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So valid. So two parts um, and they but they go hand in hand. So validation is ultimately a big exercise in statistics and data analysis and prediction. Um, it's it's uh, retrospective in the sense that uh, when we conduct validation, what we in an ideal situation, we would collect all the risk assessment scores that had been submitted over the, the course, let's say over the course of a year or, you know, of, of a few years uh, at a state level. And that could potentially be hundreds of thousands of, of risk assessment scores, you know, because you're thinking about it's any any person who comes into the con into contact with the system uh, may be given a risk assessment. Uh, uh, and so we would take those scores and then the the simplest way that this works is uh, run a correlation analysis. It gets more complicated than that, but that's that's kind of the core of it is do folks who score higher on the risk assessment tend to you know, end up recidivating more often than those who scored lower? Um, you'll often see it presented as like three or, or four bar graph kind of charts where those who were scored low, what was their risk of recidivism? How often did they recidivate versus those who scored high. And what you'd be looking for is that they're sort of progressive. The bars get higher as they go. Um, 
we, but again, it, that that's those are kind of the simple visuals. There's there's some fairly advanced analytics that go into that, where we're able to compute a, a pretty precise estimate of how often did we get it right, essentially with with this when we use that as a prediction tool. So that's validation. Uh, the bias component is just just as bias is in any context. It's it's very it can be very tricky, but sometimes it can be pretty simple. Uh, and so one way that we can assess for bias, and I think this is one of the strengths of having uh, evidence-based and, 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 and validation around it, is that we can actually see it, right? And that, that's one of the, the bigger problems with bias is when we know it's there, but we can't see it. And it's hard to actually state how, how big of a problem it is. So when bias arises in risk assessment, it could show up in several different ways, but typically it would show up in the tool is a better predictor of recidivism for one group versus another group. Or it would be that a certain item on the risk assessment is more meaningful to one group versus another group. And, 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 it, and what, to give you one kind of hard example, it has, it's been shown, and, and this is, you know, this has then led to a lot of both philosophical, statistical, and you know, kind of practical debate that for certain community members, especially minority groups, they it tends to be that certain predictors on or certain items on the risk assessment don't do not predict recidivism as well as they do for majority group members. And the question then is why would that be? And you know, and and that's that's all part of digging into it and trying to eliminate that bias. And I know uh, the, the the state of Indiana has actually commissioned reports and, and studies to to look into those very things. Uh, and so so there's there's some literature that I'd be happy to share, you know, or, or summarize for the group if needed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay. I'm sorry. Was there somebody on this? <laughs> if we're going around, I guess. <laughs> I didn't uh, see a Joel go right ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Barnes. Um, so my question is more related to the concept of risk mm -hmm. of reoffending, and to the extent that these tools may be able to, uh, I guess, correlate what type of reoffending we're talking about based upon the prior offending. Is it is it the same? So if we have a a Violent offense going in, we screen, we show a moderate risk for reoffending. Is that a moderate re risk for reoffending in a violent way, or is it just a generalized reoffending because we deal with a very wide spectrum yes, yes. of delinquent type activity? This is a fantastic question. Um, the so there are tools that that attempt to predict specific types of offending. Uh, generally a risk assessment is going to speak more broadly to just risk of any type of re of, of reoffending as it turns out it is hard it is it, it, it's hard to predict whether someone would reoffend anyways it's it's even harder to predict kind of it's a stat you know it's a probability problem and it's like even harder to predict whether they'll offend in a certain way with some exceptions though and actually violence tends is one of them there are, there are validated and, and new uh, assessments that speak directly to prediction of violence uh, reoffending risk. Um, another one that uh, I believe even the state uses is sex offending. Is that right? There's, okay, yeah, so the, there are certain, with certain exceptions, um, but it, they tend to be more kind of predicting a, a, a class of offending, not a specific offense, which I, I think is, is what you're getting at. Yeah. And, and are those so the the violent offending screening is that built into the IS that we currently have, or is that some a different assessment or screening? So the um, I'll, I'll defer to, to Michelle on exact if there is a specific violent offending tool used in the state. Sounds like maybe not. I think violence mostly is where you would see that. I know we've done some trainings and things on specific tools related to that type of. Um, episode um, and trying to get better about knowing whether that's going to occur or not. But other than that, that's the only one that I'm aware of that's used on a consistent basis. And so there, the ones that I know of, there's one that's, uh, I'm blanking on what the acronym stands for, but it's the PICRA and it's been developed at the federal level. 
Um, but to then to your question about are these built into the IaaS, it does turn out there's a lot of overlap between the, uh, the types of things that predict just general offending and specific violent offending. What often happens when you have these specialized tools is that it's it they tend to be most of the same inputs in terms of the into the prediction equation. We just sort of rebalance how much we weight one input versus another. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have maybe a multi-part question. Okay. Um, you're referencing the risk assessment tools, the suite of tools, which are designed to predict different outcomes at different points in the system, yes. whether it's failure to appear or those yes. kinds of things. Um, and when we, our office is sort of a, one of the leads on training on the risk assessment, but then there's the, there's a question of the administering the tool reliably, a valid tool reliably. But I think the next question when we come to training is, okay, so what do we do with the information? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and depending on what point in the system we are, there's different decisions being made by different actors, whether it's the judge or whether it's probation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, okay, so then what? If someone is showing high or if they're not, and, and here's why I'm asking is because um, we have this concept of overrides mm -hmm. um, and where does additional information that the court must consider as part of its sentencing, for example, um, or that probation may consider in setting conditions or are referring for services? Where does that come into play? Um, and that what does the concept of overriding mean from a from a um, researcher statistical perspective and and like I may have follow-ups, but I just okay. there. that that's great. So the that and I'm glad you used the term because I don't think I used the term override. Uh, and so that's that is the idea of building in discretion, expert and clinical discretion into a risk assessment. So the they're not meant to be strict rules-based decision-making kind of um rules, I guess. Uh they're they are meant to be guides and with, and with that concept of a guide, the idea being that it, the risk assessment is very good at collecting the information that, that you're, you're told to collect. And the idea is that that information is there for a reason, because science, behavioral science has shown that those things predict these types of behaviors better than other things that are that are not there. But it's not meant to be perfect. And it's not meant to be uh, it's not meant to substitute that if you have information that that you believe is pertinent and relevant that's not collected on here that then absolutely that's a, a moment for an override to be used and an override in this context meaning the risk assessment may have said this is a low risk person but you have information that suggests this person should be considered a higher maybe medium or high risk and it this is a bad example because the risk assessment captures this but it Maybe the, the risk assessment says this person is low, but you happen to have heard that this person has recently gone on a drug bender, you know, and, and I mean, that would be reasons for violation. So, again, it's a bad it's a bad example, but you could you kind of get the point that if there's external or, or uh, extra legal information that the, the, the that the staff member knows about, there's there is justification and there's there's reasons uh, to use overrides and put that person in a higher or a lower category. Um, and we've seen we see instances of both that that there are overrides in the person they move them up to a higher or there's overrides that they think that's that's too high of a risk. You know, I, I don't believe this person is lower. So I don't know if that captures everything. Yes. Yeah, so just a, a little bit of a follow up, though. Um, you know, when we work with the counties on the training piece, we're we try to be very clear that the tool doesn't tell you what to do. Yes. The tool identifies yes. areas in which there should be strategies yeah. in place to mitigate risk, yeah. those specific risks that are identified by the tool. Um, so what I think ultimately what we'd like to be able to see is one, there be some local conversations about developing policy that high on the risk tool doesn't mean detention per se. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you put somebody at DOC automatically. Um, it means that there's things that you should consider yes. alternatively yeah. um, if you're gonna keep them in the community. So do you have any suggestions from a policy perspective, an implementation perspective for how counties can convene around these topics um, to really you know, get a shared understanding of what the risk assessment tools do 
um, and how those communities can use those tools to inform community-based alternatives or practices uh, without without there being a perception that the tool says that we have to do this yes. or that there's no hope if, unless we do this. That's a great point. Yeah. Immediately what came to mind is some sort of like rubric for, you know, in these situations, here's a list of options. And I could see that being locally, you know, locally derived. So there might be sort of some sort of standard form. It's like a decision tree kind of thing that, you know, you you follow the path as at, if, if you're in this part of the matrix you know, these are the things that you might consider, uh, and and these are the contacts for those local agencies or programs or or what have you. Um, something a little more systematic like that would be, uh, without knowing exactly what's you know, being done in each individual jurisdiction. That would that would be where my mind would go to first. Is can we both simplify but also uh, expose all the options? So simplify in the sense of get let's have a try and have a little bit more systematic rubric. So everyone's roughly going to end up in the same place, given the same client, but uh, uh, something that uh, allows the full you know, suite of opportunities to be on display. Yeah. Thanks. Gracie. I think different things keep me up at night than Mary Kay. So <laughs> it's a little bit different, but it's, it kind of tags onto hers. So, you know, as a prosecutor, we worry more that someone's going to use this tool to say, oh, lo, you have to let them go judge, you know? And so that's what the tool said, we're done. Mm -hmm. So obviously we're, we're concerned. And I was around when these things came out and I remember my original training a little bit, but you know, the questions and how the tools administered, I think it's important for all the stakeholders to know. And I, I know a lot of it's self-reporting, but am I right that there's also things that they're supposed to check mm -hmm. that self-report and make sure that those things happen too? Is that because yeah. could you talk a little bit about like what the factors are and then mm -hmm. how important is it to make sure that those things are followed up on? Because I think sometimes when I was still in court, um, we wondered if someone was just taking the kid's word for it mm -hmm. on the things that came up on the risk assessment, because we had information different that would have flagged a lot more. Sure. So I, sure. I want you to speak to that a little bit. That, yeah, that's great. So the, the first thing you said was really interesting about uh, it, it being used as, well, this, this person scored low, meaning that they should be given uh, some sort of you know, lenient decision. Um, and what's, I don't necessarily wholly disagree, but what's, what's important to keep in mind is that a low risk doesn't mean no risk, right? So low risk is just lower relative to other people uh, who have kind of come into contact with the system. Uh, and so that, I think that would be, that would be, that's the way I think about it. And when we do like the validation studies, you will see the low risk group tends to recidivate. It varies depending on what you're looking at, but 20, 30% of the time, you know, and then you get that high risk group that's around the 60% or so. So you, that's how you kind of get that differential risk prediction. Um, and it can go lower. And sometimes we'll see really low numbers on the low risk group. And sometimes it'll be a little bit higher. But um, but again, low doesn't mean no risk. So that I think that was an that's an important point you hit on. Um, and then in terms of the type of information, so yeah, it's it's meant to be a, a mixture of both self-report, but things that can a lot mostly that could be validated in terms of these, these things could be referenced and checked. And and in an ideal situation. Uh, but this is uh, this is an area where, admittedly, uh, I would love to see the risk assessment industry improve and grow along this this point, which is one of the last things you said. In that, the risk factors that we're looking at, the risk and the needs, but I've we've, I've mostly focused on risk. But uh, it's that again a bad PR strategy. It's risk assessment, it's risk and needs. Um, but typically, the risk factors that we're studying are things that can and do change, uh, and so they're they're both we call both static and dynamic risk factors. So there are some static things that, of course, don't change over time, but dynamic things will change, and we know that those things matter quite a bit. And so it's it's not entirely clear how that should be incorporated in risk assessment. I think you'll see. That that will that's the type, that'll be where the conversation moves exceedingly over the next ten years. Um, I, there are some ideas that are out there, but you know, the it could be a brute force method, which is maybe you just give the risk assessment on a kind of repeated basis. Um, I, I think that's less than ideal because that takes a lot of resources. Um, but 
but that's one option. Uh, and then there's some other options that where maybe you consider kind of a community-based sort of social networking type model comparing people who, who scored similarly. Um, but there was an interesting study that was recently released, and again, I think this will validate what you're you're raising. Uh, that they showed it was on a it was on a, a sample of New Zealand uh, offenders. So you know, we might think, oh, they're kind of this this weird small island in the South Pacific. Um, and I and I say that because I, I I've actually visited and and we'll be going in a month. And but as it turns out, the same things that matter to New Zealanders in terms of predicting future bad behavior are the things that matter here. Um, but anyways, that study showed that even that in, in periods where a person experienced a lot of change, both good and bad changes, the risk of recidivism went up. And this is like brand new. I, I just read the study like a month ago, and I thought that's something really interesting because we typically only think about the bad, if bad things are get, getting worse, right? Did they start using drugs again or did they start doing something bad? But it could be what this suggests, and if this is uh, if this study is replicated, it could be that during just during periods of of a lot of activity, you know, then risk of 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 something bad happening takes place, and that might be something we need to take into account on later issue. Yeah, later iteration. We we're sure. go ahead. We're uh, over our allotted time, I, I, and 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 Dr. Barnes is going to be here. Uh, ha, has carved out some time. Following the meeting, I know he has a meeting scheduled with Mary Kay, so there is going to be an opportunity to do some one-on-one. -on -one, but, but uh, anybody have a burning question? You have a follow-up burning question? I was just going to ask about that. Um, is it a, really a training piece, or does anyone check back on making sure that those um, self-report and the outside information are both followed up on, or that there's and maybe yeah. That is interesting. Uh, you'd like to say Bell has to answer yeah, that. you'd like to say that they, that they are, but I don't know that I've ever seen a study that kind of looks at how often it's done. But maybe there's anecdotal evidence. I think the the biggest thing to answer your question is there are um, opportunities for agencies to have policy around those types of reviews, doing quality assurance reviews um, of those cases, supervisors and other folks. Um, also, you see the reports and you see the information. You guys can ask questions of the agency as well. So those are components of being an evidence-based practice agency is not just doing assessments, but also looking at the quality for which you're doing them and looking at the data and the research to follow. So all of those components are part of probation standards and other things to help with supporting the implementation and doing a, a good quality job. And I think part of it, what I have in mind would be things like, sorry, I'll be quick here, but like things that if the if the person's self-reporting that they've you know gotten new employment, you know, those are things that can be checked. Not everything though that is on the uh, the, the assessments can be could be checked and we do need to rely on self-reports. Nancy. I have just a quick question. I sure it's quick. Um follow up to Mary Kay's questions about the overrides. Mm -hmm. And um in your response, so Mary Kay was talking about um how the tool um uh, it, it, what you do with the tool is is important. Yes. And then you mentioned that um, something to the effect of overriding into another category. Are you actually, is it the X, is it, does a tool work in a way that says that if a um, youth um, scores as medium, um, you are actually overriding them and, and saying that they are high or is it that they stay at medium, but what you do with that information is, the, mm -hmm. the important piece. And I, I'm just trying to make sense of that. I, I, no, I see where your where your head is. I I think it would be the first that in an official kind of okay. thinking about it from at least what we see when we do a validation is when there's a flag that this score was had an override. It would be if the if the client scored a medium risk, then we see they were actually treated as if they had scored high or treated as if they had actually scored low. But so and in that way, interestingly, then it kind of does the second thing that you were saying that it then then it changes that landscape of of options that are that that person is exposed to. So a person doing the tool can't say after a, after using the tool, they say a youth is medium. Mm -hmm. uh, the tool says they're medium. Mm -hmm. I as a person can't say they're high because of this. I can say oh. what I'm going to do with that information is um, I may supervise them as if they were high, but I'm not going to say. I think it is actually even recorded as like, no, I'm changing this to that they are high. And and then they are the, the follow-up it then takes place as well. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. data collection system does not let you change the scores per se. I mean track the override separate. So there's if you're making an override, yep. you're responsible for recording what that is, whether up or down, and the justification. 
Dr. Barnes, thank you so much thank for you. your presentation. And you want us to stick around um, in, in uh, answering follow-up questions. And I'm sure if there's a question that, that pops into your head in the next few days, you want to go Absolutely. through Michelle. Yeah. Um, but, but thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, editorially, and I'm a nobody now, and it's, it's kind of comfortable. Um, I was gone for 22 months when the Army came after me, and we weren't even talking about this. I came back to the trial bench 22 months, and this was being talked about. And to get to Dr. Barnes' first point, or earlier point about um, PR, uh, what I heard, and I'm sure it was incorrectly, but I don't know if any of you suffer from, I hear what I want to hear. What I heard was, okay, in my mind, we're going to a federal judge system and you're going to add up and multiply and subtract and you're stuck. Okay, you're in a box and you can't, you can't use perception. You can't, can't use anything else. Nobody can argue. And, and what I learned very quickly, that's not true. Not true at all. And, and uh, being back in, back on the bench in various places and seeing some of the juvenile tools and some of the adult tools, um, you know, I find them helpful. Uh, I don't find them dispositive. And, and I think there's still great opportunity for prosecutors, defense counsel, probation officers, and everybody to use this effectively. Uh, I would, it'd be great if, if anybody else thought it was a good idea that, that we could lean on you to come up with the top five things that every trial judge should know about these, top five things every prosecutor, top five things every probation officer, you know, a couple of common myths, misconceptions. I don't, I don't know, but, but I think that might be helpful that for people to have in their toolbox, everybody, uh, so that we can make the best of this and it's in it. And it works for us, and, and and where it doesn't, we can address that. But I we really appreciate your time, and Michelle, thank you for coordinating that. Um, jump ahead. Our next meeting is April twelfth. Okay, uh, what we're expecting uh, is to see these preliminary reports, these draft reports, uh, August, August, who, April. Uh, Six, perhaps get those to us. April fifth, April fourth. These aren't your final products, okay? But so we can start working together. There'll be some cross pollination. Uh, some of the information that comes to us uh, through the through the chairs uh, might help us uh, decide. Hey, Devin, we've got a couple suggestions for that that grants report. Or we collectively as the oversight committee, so well, that's great work by the grants report, but now we've got some additional information. We want to tweak that um, so that we can meet our timelines. So what we want to do is to walk through uh, the work group reports and, and um, all of you have gotten some preliminary information, opportunity to talk to, be a part of. Uh, we just want to make sure that what everybody's thinking about or, or really starting to focus on, honing in on, is, is not something that the Youth Oversight Committee members going, I don't know what that is, okay? I'm gonna vote against it uh, so that we can work out those difference of opinions if they exist between now and later, right? Um, so nothing set in stone, but this, this is the, the, the process that we thought would be very helpful. I have reached out and had a couple of meetings with a couple of the work group chairs, co-chairs. So I'm going to follow up and reach out to the others and say, hey, I'll buy breakfast or I'll buy lunch or I'll Zoom with you uh, just to give you an opportunity, just to give me an opportunity uh, uh, to just, just kind of have some time together. Um, Leslie and the professional team are, are, are meeting regularly and, and Leslie's reaching out to the professional team and saying, hey, um, do you want to sit down and, and, and do another meeting with Justice David? Um, 
those of you on the committee who are not on a work group, and many of you aren't, and that's fine, right? Uh, remember, uh, there's ways in which you can participate, observe, listen to via Zoom or other, what's going on if, if that work group's of particular interest to you. Um, but we are, we are you know, committed to our, our mission and, and great work is being done. So um, we'll start with screening just because, not just because Shannon's next to me. Uh, and is there anything that you want to, to emphasize, anything you want to share, and then any questions for, for Shannon and her team? Well, we had Dr. Barnes talk to our group the last time that we met um, as well, just to kind of review those key roles um, with the validation and evidence-based practices to promote that um, public safety. We had some on our work group that probably needed to hear that just so they understood it a little better. Um, in addition, just lost all my notes. Um, we have been working on a work plan and filling that in as we kind of go along. I think that was attached to the minutes that was sent out. And we've been working on a workflow um, just to kind of show what we found when we kind of did some outreach to juvenile centers, um, prosecutors, um, judges, probation officers, and public defenders, we found that um, some people weren't sure where the tool fit in or they never saw the results of a tool, were never given that IES um, score. So we kind of are working on compiling them. We meet on Friday and we're kind of going through those results as well to see where we need to help get that education out um, to what groups and how we need to do that. Um, so that would be suggestions obviously to um, IOPS and other places to get some education um, around those areas. In addition to that, we also um, looked at the workflow with House Bill 1359 and how that was going to fit with the IES. So all of those attachments were with the stuff that we sent out as well um, with our work group. So we're working along, um, along the side of the standards committee as well. There were several of us that met with several groups of several people from the standards committee because there's some things in our task that are cross-referenced in their tasks. So we're working together on where we need to do those best practices at as well. Great, thank you. Questions? Tracy. I have a question, Shannon. Yes. Uh, so one of the things I was thinking about, and we've talked about this in our diversion group, when you want to have like a full array of diversion options for your county um, at, at different points in the system, some counties already have an agreement where everyone's met, talked as their group as they should of people in juvenile justice. And they've already decided on a, on a group of charges and things that, hey, if a kid comes in on one of these, send them to this great diversion program. We don't need that. I'm not sure if any screenings being done other than they come in. And so are you leaving it as a choice that they don't? I mean, I know they have to do it if they come in into intake, but if you just get that referral, is there some kind of option or do you want them still to do that screening tool? Have you guys talked about that? I, yes. So, I mean, do so, you get what I'm asking? I, I don't know if I'm asking. In sure. the workflow, and Michelle, will you correct me if I say this wrong? I believe in the workflow and as well as House Bill 1359, every child that has a paper referral should have an IAS score to see what their risk and needs are. Because as Dr. Barnes said, they may be low risk, but there may be needs that we need to address. And that would help inform the program. Yes. So, okay. Is there some way to, are you thinking about how to expedite that then so that they can get, because I think there's already, sometimes already an agreement that that's, they easily go into diversion. I think um, under Hospital 1359 and with the workflow that we're putting out, it will show kind of um, those steps. And I know we're kind of in the preliminary talks of the workflow. It may be that we give them a 
we give each county, I mean, 92 counties, it's done 92 different ways. Yes, it is. <laughs> so we give them a workflow with best practices of this is where this tool should be done in the workflow. And they can fill it in with kind of their steps too. Some counties have detention centers that some counties don't. So I, I think that on that workflow, we will have better options. ideas and options for them. Okay, thanks. Hey, Shannon. As Dr. Burns was speaking, I couldn't help but think about behavioral health and we do that CANS assessment. And the only thing that captures is that the whether the youth is currently involved in the youth justice system. So I think there's a gap between the information that's collected from the IS and how does that go together as part of being collateral information in uh, shaping treatment for that youth. And so I think it would be important that there's some level of education where it's joint mental health and uh, probation, uh, providing that overview and how, and just review that tool because that would provide a lot more information, I think guidance and that coordination. And I think that's where it kind of crosses over with our policies, procedures, our standard group, our standards group, because many counties do do mental health assessments, but it's not standardized and it's not, you must. Um, it's if you can, or if, if you choose to. So I think we've, we've talked about that too with uh, Magistrate Foley and, and the standards group. Question about um, the response it, that, that all referrals would need to or require a diversion tool. So thinking about the counties where um, following the letter of the law in terms of referrals going to the prosecutor's office first, and then if they decide they want to um, proceed with or want some information, they send it to the probation department for a preliminary inquiry. Some of those prosecuting attorney's offices have diversion programs that never go to probation. So is it um, is there a thought that the the prosecutor's office could do the IS detention tool or or diversion tool, excuse me, or how does is, is that are you for that far into it yet? Yeah, we've talked about that. Okay. Um, I think what our thoughts are is that the prosecutor's office may get that referral first. Mm -hmm. I worked in one of those counties previously, but the probation department's still going to have to do that initial. I as to give the prosecutor that information because they may not have that background information for the risk and the needs. And they may just, may just get a small police report a paragraph long and they don't know really what's going on yet. So I think it would be it would be the prosecutor's office and the probation department working together to get the prosecutor that I as score. And does the do you have to do a preliminary inquiry to do the I as or can can that just be the the re, uh, it, instead of referring to the probation department for a preliminary inquiry, could a prosecutor's office refer to the probation department for an IAS diversion tool, and that's it? They could do their the tools. their screener tools for the disposition tool, right? Um, I'm thinking just of the diversion the diversion tool. I think they would still need to talk to the juvenile at some point okay. to get some of those answers. Um, for those questions. I mean, it's a very short tool. It could probably be done over the phone in 15, 20 minutes with a, a juvenile and a parent together. Okay. And my mind is going to not further bringing youth closer to the system, those kinds of things that previously may have been a, um, a decision made without them having to take off work, you have some from school to come in and get a tool done, those kinds of things. So you think it, it's possible it could be done? I, I think it's possible that counties could work around that. Okay, thank you. But still get the information that they need to make a informed decision sure. and give that to the prosecutor. Thank you. Good conversations. Any other questions? Um, I think what, I, what I've looked at is, is everybody's doing a great job. I, I think keep it simple, right? And, and wherever you get to try to focus on uh, or at least give consideration to why is this important um, and, and what your priorities are. 
sometimes there is a tendency to want to do everything. Uh, I get Saturday morning, I have a to-do list that's like 400 things, just like most of you. And by mid-Saturday afternoon, I'm worn out, I'm frustrated, I'm depressed, I'm beating myself up because I've done three. Well, I've done three, and I underestimated how significant those were or how much time they take, right? Uh, so prioritize, or at least your recommendations. Uh, if you're sitting in on these meetings, if you're professional staff, if you, uh, I, I think it's important to, to, to give some uh, prioritization for people down the line that will be making uh, decisions. Uh, and, and again, simple, what has to be done? What are your recommendations? And, and, and then finally give some consideration to how do we do it? Uh, I think the best advice I can give to everybody you can take to your work groups is pretend this is gonna be implemented in a county where Steve David is the trial judge. And I, 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 am, I, I need help. I need it as simple as possible. I need to know why. Uh, so when I'm talking to my uh, collaborators, the team, when I'm talking to the prosecutor, I'm talking public defender, probation, youth services, uh, we're not overwhelming, right? Because as soon as it's perceived as overwhelming, it's not going to happen. And we can have the greatest plan, but if it's if it's too complicated, if it's if it's people are too afraid to get involved in it, it will be much to do about nothing. And that's not, you know, baby steps, baby steps. So so really just put a picture of stupid Steve David as the judge. Um, and and everybody else is is in my in my class in that county. And we we want to do the right thing. We're good people. We want to do the right thing. Um, just like the the assessment tool, I've been in a county since I became a senior judge where where there's the tool nobody even mentioned it, but it was complete. And then another county where this is the tool, this is what it says. And nobody wanted to dispute that. And then I've been in a county where the the public defender, the prosecutor, were like, "Okay, yeah, but." And I want to. And so, so again, think operationally, right? Mm. I'm, I'm 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 just sharing that. I may be wrong, uh, but on the off chance that I'm right, think in terms of what's what's likely to be as operational as easy as possible. Thank you, Shannon. Mary Kay, data. Justice David, I'm gonna walk through just briefly each of the sections of our, our outline report that was submitted today. First, thanks to Lisa Thompson for putting it together. Um, the first section in our report is a list of the de deliverables. Those are just the things that were outlined in statute that we um, our data group is required to develop. But along the lines of what Justice David just mentioned, um, this is a pretty significant undertaking. And a lot of our conversations, while have been, they have been very, very um, robust, a lot of participation, they're very complex and complicated, and everything seems to be driven by one other thing. And so we're really trying to wrap our minds around what are the foundational elements of doing this well. And to some extent, the plan is to develop a plan. So um, <laughs> and you'll see how that's reflected a little bit in some of this. Now, and, but to having said that, we do have some very concrete steps and tasks that we think are really essential to building a solid foundation. So the first you see that we have a, um, drafted a goal. Um, it's certainly subject to this group's input. I won't spend time on that, but to the degree that you have any questions about that, or if you want to provide any suggestions for content or clarity, please go ahead and submit that to me and or to Lisa. Um, one of the essential things that we need to do is to, to adopt a list of standardized definitions. And there are some so resources for that, such as what JDAI is using in, some of, in their counties, as well as the red data, um, the red definitions. We've looked at those. Um, and there are some things that we think that we can wholesale adopt uh, pretty easily as we think about how this is going to look statewide. There are, are some other things that are a little more challenging because we have had some um, We've had some, some of the definitions are more uh, expanded in terms of practice than, than are, they're not as precise as, as would be required for us to do some real quality data collection and ultimately research around this. So there's some things that we really probably need to narrow or come to consensus on how we want to define um, some examples are referral um, or detention. 
Um, we now have a statutory definition for diversion, but that's used differently in different communities. So there's probably going to be, we're identifying those as areas of need um, to get some consensus around, uh, at least for the purposes of our data collection plan, but then also um, so that we can see how this is all going to look in practice moving forward with our evaluation piece. Um, one of the things that we really talked about is that we don't have good information on to on a case level who is which, which youth are in detention at any given time. We have individual uh, detention centers. We have the log of juveniles held. But what we have identified as a group is that we really need to have line level, case level, youth level information across the entire system so that we can begin to learn about what's happening and begin to make some decisions um, not just at the case level, but ultimately from a policy perspective, that starts with it starts with law enforcement contact, which is a whole other conversation, um, or the referral contact. But then we also definitely need to get, wrap our arms around what's happening in, in the detention centers. One of the discussions that we had was some work that's been happen, happening on the uh, criminal side around victim notification that Devin's team is involved in with the Department of Correction, pulling out into a repository some of that local jail information sort of envision something similar for detention information so that we could get that information in real time um, and understand what our numbers are looking like on a regular basis, including why they're there and how long they're there um, and for what reasons they're there, because there could be several. So that was one of our big conversations. Our research agenda is going to be something I think is going to be under development. Largely, it will be initially driven by what information that we have reliable access to. Um, which sort of bleeds into um, our data plan. Um, one of the things that we need to think about, well, one of the things that we hope to be able to do to craft a long-term sustainable state level plan, which will be multifaceted and many years in the making, um, would be to work pretty intensely with some counties who are interested in helping us identify uh, what are the data collection mechanisms? How are we doing things differently at a local level so that but but how can we ensure that we are capturing data consistently using the same terminology by the same definitions that we ultimately adopt so we would hope that we would be able to work with a handful of counties to do some pretty intensive work that would also include some uh, work around process shannon mentioned there's a myriad of ways to do some of these things and for us to um be better informed about what, about what our long-term plan looks like. We have to have a handle on what the variation in practices are. We don't want to be caught with any unintended consequences, um, or we don't want to make any assumptions about what's happening, only to find out that it's not once we take this full scale. Um, the, the funding piece around local data collection is a little tricky. Um, a lot of it depends upon to what degree we're asking them to make changes in how they collect data or what data they collect. But we also acknowledge that if we were to build an interface of detention center data, that's an expense. If we have to build any systems at the Office of Court Technology, for example, that's an expense. So that's probably a TBD ultimately on this, this round of our uh, plan. I won't go through the initi existing initiatives, but we did review what's currently in place from a data collection standpoint. We, did, we have reviewed um, other pieces of information, like what's happening with JDAI, other policies and practices, we're continuing to do that. Looking specifically at the challenges, um, lack of information around that initial contact a youth has with the system. How is it possible for us to capture that? Or is it possible for us to capture that? That could be something that we study. Um, linking data systems is always an issue. Inconsistent application of definitions, which we are, would try to get a handle on. Um, variation in local practices is it makes it a challenge and also is a barrier when we try to put something out at the state level, because if we don't consider variation in practices, it puts us at a significant disadvantage. As Justice David said, it makes people feel overwhelmed that they're not being heard. So we need to be very careful about that. Um, and we also, we also need to achieve a high confidence level in the data that we do have. There are some opportunities here that we think are very exciting. Um, but ultimately on some additional recommendations, these maybe fall outside of the, the scope or purview of the data work group, but we do think that they're important to institutionalize this at various levels. Um, we need to have some sort of formal youth justice group at the local level. JDAI has it, some counties may have it who are not JDAI. Um, there may be more counties that have something than don't, um, but I don't think that we really know what that looks like. 
Um, and I think some structure around that would be helpful long term. And we do have some tinkering recommendations for the reporting requirements under 1359. We think there's some challenges on the timelines and Julie helped us work through some of those that we may be recommending to Representative McNamara or at least asking for some grace on. Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately we would ask that the work group exist in perpetuity uh, as long as this, this these discussions are being had. Um, we think the data work group probably as well as the other work groups need to be around for a very long time. Thank you, Mary Kay. Questions, comments? You're on base, off base, out of the park, move forward, charge. Any, any questions or comments? I really like the uh, institutionalization, right? Um, love JRAC, but that's really adult <laughs> center, not juvenile. <laughs> Here, Justice Goff talking about JRAC and something <laughs> on that other spectrum. Um, good. Not uh, one question for Mary Kay. I have one question. All right. <laughs> I was going to call on Judge Joel Hansi. Speak into the mic. Put him under pressure. Uh, do you know when or if, when you get your definition document ready, Jake can be shared. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, I just, I know from our group, that's one of the things that we talk about a little bit because there is a little bit of a data issue with the diversions and we don't want to propose or have different definitions than you. Well, it's funny that you say that because we were going to rely on you for that definition. But <laughs> no, I yes, certainly we'll share it. But I do think one of the important pieces of this, and this is a this is a part of going very slowly on this, mm -hmm. is that even once we adopt some definitions, I think we need to test drive those definitions in our in the handful of counties that we work with. But absolutely, we'll share that with you. Um, I think right now, though, Tracy, we are really, really going to be relying on the the statutory definition of diversion as it currently, you know, as it was presented in the most recent legislation, um, which we know is limiting. Um, it is limiting, but I think um, I don't know that it necessarily prevents or precludes counties from doing something different. It's just we need to know what it is so that we're not calling something that's not diversion as defined by the statute diversion. If it's doesn't follow the requirements in the statutes, it's something, it's just not diversion. I agree. So th that's where we're at. And, and Mary Kay, I would just add, you, you and you put a note to this effect in your report, I think any of the definitions where there is code, the code will be referenced, mm -hmm. right? So that we're, we're clear that that's the baseline. If it's defined in statutes, we gotta Let's start, start with the law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always a good thing. Yeah. Judge Dolhany, did you have a question? Yes. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, to the extent anybody anywhere thought or thinks that we were given this charge in, in summer or fall, we'll give to the 8.5 million, 6.5 million people in the state of Indiana thumb drive <laughs> that, that establishes, uh, modifies, reforms, creates the perfect system, they're wrong. And, and I'll, I'll be the first one to take a bullet for any one of you. Um, this is almost like a bad Steve David analogy, uh, a sort of a constitutional convention, right? We're, we're trying to, we've been given essentially carte blanche with some, with some parameters to, to help us get to where the state needs to be. So take advantage of that. And, and we've heard several times plan for a plan or the plan is a plan. Uh, uh, when in doubt, move slowly, right? Excellent. Just David. Yes. I, I, um, when I want to, I think I remember um, the charge of this group is certainly that what was in the statute. Um, I feel like early on there was a recognition that there might be a request at some point to actually um, change some of the language of 1359 if we felt it was necessary. Okay. The reason I'm asking that is I, I'm stuck a little bit on. Um, uh, yes, statutory def definitions for sure, mm -hmm. um, but it, I don't want to lose sight of the concept of if the intent of this bill or, or one of the intents of this bill was to um, increase diversion. Um, I want to make sure that we are not creating processes that actually bring youth closer to the system. And I, I think I'm just still mulling in my head the uh, screening and assessments piece around um, 
you know, what, what is happening now is really allowing youth not to necessarily touch the system. And I certainly appreciate needing to understand who is getting diverted and who is not. I think that that's a fantastic, but it seems like now we're saying they are gonna to have to touch the system in a way that they didn't before. And I think the overarching concept is to increase opportunities to keep them further away. Um, and if that is the statutory, um, if that's because of how the statute is written that we may have an opportunity at some point to request some changes. And I don't even know what those would be. I'm just kind of thinking out loud right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's part of, of identifying the priorities and, and how we need to do that, and what the suggestions are. And, and, and that comes to this group to make recommendations unanimously or or simple majority or say, hey, these are the, here's the 32 deliverables, but here's the 612 things that need to be done to get to those 32 deliverables or 17 of them. And certainly we don't want to inadvertently create a system that it takes eight hours to divert a child and two hours to put them in the system. Mm -hmm. okay. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so uh, let's let's go out of order. Let's be uh, different. Let's move to Tracy, diversion. Uh, Speaking of diversion. Uh, hello, okay. So we just uh, last met January 27th as a whole group and our best practices group just met on February 8th. So if you've looked through our diversion work group so far, we have a very kind of broad deliverable to establish policies and protocols for diversion and, and informal adjustment and developing parameters for the diversion grant program, which we somewhat have kind of already seen in uh, Devin's work group that already reported. But um, so we go through and list the best practices. We've done our research there. We um, have our takeaways from other counties. Um, we're really ready to start writing, um, other than uh, we did decide we still need to, um, a smaller group of us are going to go to a site visits for some counties um, for specific programs because we want to hold up um, in the report an array of programs that are doing good work. It's going to take a minute because it, we can find programs that's easy to make sure they're doing good work. That's, you know, and it goes back to the data issue um, and whether there's anyone continuously looking at their data and seeing what their what their outcomes are. So um, we're going to dig into that next. Um, so we have that work left to do. So there's going to be a section in our report that's not only talking about model type programs, but then listing those, some of those programs that exist in Indiana so people can have a better idea when they go back to their county um, how to set these up. And as Justice David was discussing, we're trying to think of it as a how-to when the county gets it. So there's there was a lot of discussion in our group about, do we want to say required and, and encouraged, or do we just want to leave it a little more open? Because we don't want counties to look at this and think, oh, I don't know, I'm not doing all that because it's <laughs> too detailed. So we're trying to leave it as a walkthrough best practice, you know, get your group together, have the look at your data. What do you need diversion on? What makes sense? Because we can't just say, oh, divert all this, all that. You might not even have those in your county. So why develop that program? So we're trying to leave it as a walk through what you need to think through when you do it. Um, strongly encourage that kind of thing and talk about that continuum of options. Um, and then we are going to have a little bit of data discussion included in there. And um, we've just been thinking ahead to the communication outreach to get people to take these diversion grants when they happen. We want people already to be thinking um, plan to plan. So if you just get a planning grant, maybe that's going to be something that's allowed so that you can work towards getting something up and running in your county. Um, and then what else were we were talking about? Um, just communicating that, that it's going to be um, happening, what kind of outreach we need. I have a I have a juvenile summit for prosecutors in the fall. I'm definitely going to be promoting this somehow. Mm -hmm. So what else can we do to just get the word out about diversion and what's going to be coming in the next couple of years? So that's where we are. We're, we're divvying up writing this report and doing our last bit of work. Thank you, Tracy. Questions? You know, there's nothing wrong. And, and if you think there's it's wrong, then push back. Uh, there's nothing wrong with as as 
all of you move through and we as a, a committee look at this, um, there is great value, I think, in, in looking at specific counties, suggesting, asking, are you interested in this? Are you interested in piloting this? You know, you, you could be a great test case. Um, uh, maybe you're not ready to implement, maybe you're ready to do the planning. Um, and, 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 and to, to reach out doesn't prevent someone from, uh, app applying for the grants. Right. But, but you may, you may get, uh, counties, uh, different size, different geographic location, um, to, to engage by, by just reaching out to them, or at least having somebody reach out to them and talk to them. Um, Harry Decker. Thank you, Tracy. AKA oh. Harley Woman. Use the mic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, our group, my gosh, I first, I can't say enough about them. Very robust, lots of questions, lots of energy in our room, um, lots of knowledge. We really spent so much time uh, initially um, educating people on what really happens on a daily basis in the Department of Correction for kids. Um, there's such a misconception uh, how many hours a day our kids spend in school all day. Um, so, you know, what's happening, what's happening for kids, the requirements that, um, you know, we, we need to feed them and let them shower and um, let them sleep and um, they have to have outside rec and all the things. So when we get down to, you know, what are we providing in, in the terms of treatment and helping them um, exit how much uh, family involvement there is, not much. Um, so our group, I really think that we started um, with the basis from the conversation happened that, that, that happened with the group from uh, Council of State Governments, where we already came in with some knowledge. So um, about what people were talking about or what they thought was the, the best way to um, transition kids out, because that is that's our goal. What is the best way to uh, reintegrate kids back into uh, your communities? Um, and what what services happen if there needs to be services. So um, first, if they were all here, big thank you to my group. We are not done. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of blurred lines. So what we put together really was just at our last meeting where we finally said, let's start narrowing this down. So what you guys see is where we got um, with you know starting the narrowing it down. Um, big push for uh, kids to, for counties to, um, in charge um, of what happens with kids that, that uh, are released from DYS. So we have a lot of work to do yet. You can see, and we, there are a lot of words in here because there's a lot of questions. You know, one of the things um, is that you, as everybody exper is experiencing um, uh, the provider issue, mm -hmm. DOC, we do that as well. Um, what kind of uh, push is this going to be on that system? Uh, what kind of funding? You know, right now when we talk about uh, kids that are uh, using DCS providers, um, we do that as well. We have a memorandum with DCS to be able to use their providers. You know, the the I don't want to call it a burden, but I don't know what other word, but how that is going to impact. Um, even funding for services. You know, the, we had a conversation, do, the, do you look at every youth that, re, that releases? As you guys know, we can keep kids till they're right before their 21st birthday to, uh, do we need to look at those kids? And so the decision so far is look at all of them, mm -hmm. but it really would be that the county would determine um, do they need services or don't they? So um, that's that's really kind of where we are. Um, we got a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> we've done a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other topics that kept coming up, um, which we have put a, a little blurb in here that's really not something that we were tasked with, is to ask that we start looking at, are we getting the right kids that are sent to, to DOC? So. There, there's that section because we had a large portion of our group say we have to look at 
the kids that are coming. So that's it. No, I would love to have people, um, you know, if you want to set in, um, if you want to send questions, if you want to send suggestions, absolutely. I'd love it. Terry? Yes, Terry. <laughs> yep, so just a quick uh, question for clarification. On that fourth bullet point, it says counties would use DCS contract providers. Are you talking about after they've been discharged from probation? So to speak, or well, it, you know, and here if that's thank you I for just that want to question because there really is a lot of talk about do they go back on probation? How to, how do um, how do counties oversee? Yeah, you know. So as an example, the only way that I can provide services for for youth is if I place them on parole. Yeah. I cannot I cannot provide a service to a discharge sure. youth, right? So is that going to be the same? I don't want to keep saying burden, but I, we're not, you know, we're not blinded to what's what kind of impact this could have. So it's a gap. yes, it's going to have to be the county has to have some type of tie or control, yeah. um, you know, to those. Yes. Yeah, that's a complicating piece. There's a gap mm -hmm. because we have to have an open case in yes. order to provide services. And yes. What we don't want is for juvenile justice reform to re to turn into increasing child welfare yes. involvement. Right. Right. Um, so uh, I appreciate that. That's very helpful. And another thing, just a comment on the ongoing discussions, just to let you know, the QRTP model. Yes. Um, would love to know a little bit more about um um, how that's required, because there's so many pieces to it. Yes. But the benefit of the QRTP model is to draw down for e funds and very few juvenile justice youth qualify because the youth has to qualify and also the program has to qualify. So while okay. the program are qualify, a lot of our youth that are involved in the juvenile justice system do not. Right. Um, and there's a lot involved. Now, we already do a lot of it, um, which is great, um, but it wouldn't necessarily um benefit from a federal funding perspective, but there are some great pieces to it as far as limiting time within, within a facility, which is why we as a state move forward with it from the child welfare perspective, because um, it really pushed us to ensure that kids weren't lingering in residential facilities and that we weren't sending kids to residential facilities that didn't, that didn't need to be there. Yes. Um, so uh, interested to hear how that conversation goes and I'm more than happy to help if I can. Yes, thank you. Yeah. About step -down services. Yeah, you have to have um, at, uh, some to six months yes. of post-discharge or, or services to prevent re-entry into residential treatment if at all possible. Yes. I think that's the main part that the group talked about yes. was we we have that aftercare model with QRTP. Can we do something similar, similar. with leaving DOC right. where it there's is. it is yes and and, and, and again it's the grants. I'm sorry, no some of that grants mm -hmm. opportunities for providers in the community to provide that gap, mm -hmm. and, and then again, they wouldn't be in your system or your system. Sorry, right. no, no. Um, I was just to say. You know, look around the room, extremely talented, the work groups, extremely talented, diverse backgrounds, very experienced. We have deliverables, but nothing is to prevent you, us, from saying, in addition, mm -hmm. okay, uh, we want to, we have some suggestions so that we're not uh, increasing diversion by uh, making it 10 times harder, mm -hmm. right? Or, or, where we you need to look at, we may not if 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 the if the requirement is that someone comes out of DOC and the only way they can get services is be on parole, uh, there may need to be a suggested legislative change, right? Or 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 um, an understanding that that parole can be, you know, may not be the robust or normal parole, um, so that they don't come out of DOC. Having, having, you know, and 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 we're not we're giving them the services to transition them, but we're also requiring them to report every week and do A B C D E F G. Right. And we know that the chances are they're coming back. Where if we would leave them alone, I mean, some counties right have dumped out probation and started all over, and and you know doing their risk assessment and things, and we're only going to put these kids on probation. These other kids, we're going to take that calculated risk. That we're never going to see him again, and if we see him again, it's going to be for something minor, and we're going to devote our resources. Um, 
to the kids that really need the resources. So don't hesitate to, to bring to this group and this group don't hesitate to say, what, well, well, can we include something else? Can we include some, we'd like to do this, right. uh, particularly if it's a legislative fix. Mm -hmm. Terry, I had a, just a question when you said, I know we don't want to um, have more cases, but would, would that in your caseload, does that include like an informal adjustment or a, like a miscellaneous, a JM case? So what we don't want is to have involvement that's not due to abuse and neglect. And that's what we're seeing is there is this overlapping because we're the ultimate safety net when the kids are there, the parents are struggling, and it's not that they don't want to do well by their kid. They just don't have resources. Child welfare becomes the only option. So what we're trying to do is prevent the kids from doing what they were supposed to do in the court system um, and get discharged, but not necessarily get the services that they and their family need. So that's a big piece is the family piece, um, getting them what they need. And then they end up in child welfare because there's no other place to catch them. Right. So there's a gap. And if there's a way to fill in that gap so that the, the service providers don't have to have a contract necessarily with DCS. So they're DCS contract providers, but they have a mechanism of getting paid to provide services without having a DCS case. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or not even because they are done with probation, right? Well, if, if or transitioning out, right. It will depend on how they transition out. It depends on the definition, yeah. Mary Kay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it all comes back to it all yeah. comes yeah. together. Absolutely. Yeah. I have, one of the problems that I see kind of about on what both of you have talked about, one of the problems I see often is that we have kids in detention and they end up with DCS because their parents won't pick them up. <laughs> and so, and some of the parents, and I get their chins case and I talk to them and their parents know exactly what they need, but sometimes because they have insurance and so many of the programs like options and so many of the residential facilities in Indiana don't take children that have private insurance. So sometimes you get parents that know exactly what their kids needs, want to help, show up for the hearings, are involved, but they also know what's going to happen if they pick their kids up from detention because their kids have needs that they can't meet. So they're like, nope, I'm not picking them up. Right. And then they end up with the chins case that they really, really don't need. And so there's this kind of weird gap. And I really don't know what to do about that. It's it's easy when you can look at the parents and say, well, you're the problem and you, you need our help. It's harder when you have the parents that they get locked out because they fall into this weird gap, you right. know, and, and we've we got a lot of Chen's kids like that. We experience the same things. We're, we are raising kids in Department of yeah. Corrections because parents will not pick them up. Yeah. They don't want, you know, and, and so now you're you're 18 and now what do I do? Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about this all the time and we, you know, it's not a, a great deal of kids, but you know, we, we experience the same things yeah. that the parents are, will just say, I'm not coming. Yeah. I don't want them. I'm just going to do something else. And so, you know, I don't want to make it sound like that, even though if I'm going to provide services, there has to be that tie to parole. That doesn't mean we're not making referrals, right? So we can say we set up, we have transitional uh, staff who are setting up mental health appointments. Mm -hmm. We're setting up, um, we're, you know, setting up appointments with DWD. We're setting up appointments. We're making sure the transition back to school. The problem is, is that when, it, and this was the example I used because we've all done this. I'm sorry if anybody here is from Bureau of Motor Vehicles. I love you all, but hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I used this. I said, we all know what it's like as adults to go get a, get a new license. I don't know about all of you, but you take every piece of paper from the time you were born until <laughs> the number of names that you have changed. And then they say, you need that one sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> so now I'm going to go home. We're all coming back. Mm -hmm. Right. Our kids are not going to do that. Make it difficult for them. They're not showing up. Mm -hmm. um, we, they don't have transportation. My folks can't help. You know, once once you're out, I my my case management staff can't go pick you up and take you. And so when you have nobody, you know, we're just really and handing them to parents who um, it's difficult for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, there were so many discussions and so many great discussions. One of the discussions is um, reminding um, 
the courts, how important it is to these kids that you guys still care. Mm-hmm. How many kids say, that, yeah, they sent me here and I never see them mm-hmm. or they never ask to reach out to me, you know? And, and I, I, it, there's so many discussion about, you know, but it, it, you know, it's just one of the discussions that's been had because our kids um, do not have a lot of support. Yeah, you know, they come, and it it it, it underscores defined mission, uh, but but other variables, other thing, other recommendations, and 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 you know, the data work group uh, shared, uh, Mary Kay, Mary Kay shared, and I think many of you think the same thing is some sort of institutionalized group that would address these. Yeah. Um, and, and I, just to make you laugh as we pause for a moment, I lost my driver. I didn't lose my driver's license. I threw it away in the trash and I know I threw it away in the trash. So I just went to the BMB and I took my passport, my birth certificate uh, and my military ID card, et cetera, et cetera. I get up there and they didn't ask for any of that. <laughs> they gave me a piece of paper and said, write your social security number down. I wrote my social security number down. They took it. Okay, pulled up. Okay, looked at me. I guess it was okay. Gave me the paperwork. Said, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, and X number of dollars. So I signed, 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 give it back. And the person goes, legal. And somebody came over that said supervisor and looks at it and says, um, the signature's outside the block. Uh, that's not acceptable. Uh, have him, and I'm right here. Have him sign it inside the block. And I'm, I'm like, chuckle, chuckle. Sure, of course. <laughs> so but that's what we're trying to prevent, right? Right. Uh, I mean, it, it really underscores what we're trying to prevent that occurs unintentionally, intentionally, and we're all guilty of that. And and it's how do we how do we improve this system? The sustaining sustain, sustainability is really what we're going for. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Great discussion. Was the block nut big enough? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it, right. it, it's not as if I signed on other, I just, I was in there. I just don't know. I just scribbled. Yeah, I scribbled it. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> Yes. Um, request. Yes. Um, back in the when the juvenile justice reform task force back when the juvenile justice reform task force met, um, Representative McNamara was really clear on the power of language, and we talked about this population that um, Terry's group is really referring to this as reintegration services, and somehow I think it translated to transitional services. Um, I would just request, and I don't I don't know it has to be a statutory change that we really think about the reintegration piece of this, because transition just means a change, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're thinking about the youth coming back to the communities where they lived, may live, um, I I don't know how we we do it, but I think about it more in in reintegration. How are we reintegrating these youth into the lives they had, excuse me, before they went to DOC? Mm -hmm. So that's all just just a plug for for using that language um, and, and because it's a mindset. Too that we that we're not always conscious of that these kids are coming back and not just transitioning. It's a good point. There might be an even better word yeah. uh, as we move forward. Um, Judge Foley. Okay. Well, I'm not going to read it's already in the probation standards, so the bold is the actual standard. What we have added um, to three. Paragraphs A and B already exist in before. Judge Mulhansen is a chair of the probation committee, but we've already had discussion. We really need to look at probation standards as a whole.
standards. It's a little bit more gender neutral. Um, we've got juvenile, we've got child, we've got offender, we've got student, we've got eventually be taking a look at. So what we have provided to you in thought is to use the word use. To set out separate standards for use as opposed to adults. Um, and what we determined after guideline for how probation. Standards, but also meet the expectations of 1359. That the probation committee uh, approval of these before we go. So we have had uh, a meeting. Well, we've got some really good feedback from, from the probation committee regarding what their expectations. We're expecting our first draft to really go for the directors of the judicial conference at their April 18th meeting. So we questions of her is getting our first final draft ready to the board of directors of the judicial conference. Great, thank you. Questions, comments? Very good. Cirilla, are you ready to? Mm -hmm. uh, what we presented was an outline that's going to inform our report. Um, our next meeting is February 23rd at 11. And then we'll vote on the outline as it is written. Um, we are going to look at the overview of the current juvenile behavioral health system, and clearly our system is complex and ever-changing, mm -hmm. and so we probably will ask that this group continues the work, um, uh, definitely with the definition and glossary of terms, we know that diagnostic uh, evaluation, diagnostic impression, biopsychosocial assessments, um, the CANs, the IS, all um, have different meaning depending on the space and who's administering that. So we wanted to be clear in terms of definition. So probably the majority of this report will be definitions depending on who is delivering those services. Uh, we're looking at the services that are currently being provided under behavioral health. I think there is a difference between what DMHA funds and there's other systems that also uh, provide behavioral health services to justice involved youth that some of them I have no idea of. So uh, also be trying to pull and gather those resources as well. Um, definitely, we have identified lots of gaps and barriers in the system, 
uh, one being the lack of facilities. We do not have a full continuum of services across the, just in general, the youth continuum. Um, and so just looking at what we would recommend in building up those services that would include prevention, would include aftercare and follow-up services. Uh, and system collaboration. Um, I've been with the state for 12 years and still I'm always surprised to learn about a new program that impacts kids and I'm like, didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially now since with all the ARPA and PERSA money, there's lots of funding of programs that cross uh, for trauma-informed youth, for justice-involved youth. So there's a lot going on right now. And how can we look at our provider pool and who delivers what services and which systems and maybe replicate that, not using your current providers, but a lot when we talk about especially those assessments and who can do them. I know DCS has a structure for that. Is there some way we can replicate that with some different level of funding uh, that we can support doing those assessments as opposed to sending them off to get that diagnostic evaluation? Of course, everyone knows staffing and workforce is a huge issue. We talk about where we're gonna send our children, families, and if there's no providers or nowhere to send them, that's a problem. So just talking about that and looking at the different levels of professionals that can deliver services, not to water down what they get, but look at training and competencies, so we are able to support our youth and families. Um, we looked at costs and reimbursement rates with Medicaid and what that entails. And the issue of parity is a huge one, especially for our families who are not supported through uh, Medicaid. Uh, I do receive a lot of calls of parents who have higher incomes, have private insurance, and there is not very limited options for them other than to say, well, I relinquish my prayer, my parental so I can get services. Uh, that's something that's a bigger issue that really, really um, needs to have some more legislative with the Department of Insurance. Um, Parent engagement. I can tell you I had, I enjoyed it, had, had so much insight from we had our family youth advisory meeting Saturday it was pretty lively <laughs> and um they had a lot to say and I think it was I think one or two of my biggest takeaways was parents feeling um discounted and not recognized as being that resource and it's tricky you know your parents go you have your kid in court and you're kind of in this kind of tenuous situation and relationship with the court system. However, they really um, communicated if they had someone in the beginning of that. You know, like parents said, I didn't raise my child to be this way, but I'm, look, I'm being looked at as I committed a crime mm -hmm. um, as well. So in any ways we can look at formalizing and training and how to engage uh, parents early and early intervention. That was another uh, thing they talked about. Uh, they felt very strong about uh, the diagnostic assessments and kids being sent away, really talked about rural areas and having resources for hotspots because they said some of our, we don't have internet or telehealth and how is that helpful? Mm -hmm. So um, really gave some very helpful feedback. Um, also, what resonated is just the understanding of our system, that lots of our families do not understand how our systems work and connect. They only see it from a single perspective from the court system, and that's all they know. And so to begin to talk to them or ask some feedback about a behavioral health system is like mind blowing. Like 
And, and you know, and one of the feedback I gave um, to Takia and was we need to really do a better job educating about our system. When you come in our system, what does that mean? When you come in the child welfare system, what does that mean? When you're receiving mental health services, rest, what does that mean in terms of where you're at uh, with your child? Uh, the plan for behavioral health is system coordination. <laughs> that uh, right now. We're about out of time. So okay. if you could. You can read the rest. <laughs> wrap it up. No, I, I just, I just. No. I, so. Any questions? No, I'm going to just shoot to the question. And, and I would encourage you, if you have questions, to email Cirilla and, and, and not trying to. Yeah, no. Um, and Kia, we're going to put you at the start of, of the agenda next time uh, because you've got about four minutes. But but uh, Cirilla gave you a great advertising there. <laughs> Well, it was a good conversation. And I think, you know, that's the value of having this work group put together. Um, the overwhelming, you know, response is they want more options outside the system. And I think it lends to what all of us have kind of discussed today. Um, you know, Nancy, you started, started talking about how do we keep them away from the system? Um, and, you know, as they mentioned, Cirilla, on Saturday, like that's exactly what they want. And they want some autonomy over that. They don't want to be told what to do. They want to be involved in the process from the beginning. But that speaks more to what you said is there has to be some more education around that, because I think that they are unaware of what the system does and how it's designed, you know, in some aspects and what options are out there. And so creating ways that we can share that with youth and families and having spaces in these systems to walk them through the process. There are a lot of parents that this is their first time. They didn't raise their babies like this, you know, and so they're being thrown into these situations and then their rights are being taken away. You know, it's your child has to do this. You have to take off work to do that. And so it does create a lot of issues um, that I think we can put in some different things and policies that can help address. Um, Julie was kind enough to put together this protocol for visiting members coming to speak to the youth and uh, family council. Um Basically, the, the structure is the same each time. We do our icebreakers in the beginning to get to know each other. I have you guys introduce yourselves and kind of explain, you know, this work. Um, there is a large group discussion after you guys present. And then we do ask that you come with specific questions that you're wanting to have answered um, to guide the work and the reporting that you guys are doing um, in your individual spaces. We put them into breakout groups so that they can discuss and, you know, dive, dive a little bit deeper. Um, and then we come back and kind of share those out as a group. There's always um, a secretary keeping notes. Then I meet with the chairs that Wednesday following that Saturday to kind of go over any additional thoughts and things that they may have. And then we'll submit a final uh, kind of this written meeting minutes to you guys. Um, our next meeting is February 18th, and I believe it's the diversion group that's coming. Yes. yes. Um, and so they are looking forward to having you guys. Again, they are they're a very passionate group. They have tons of lived experience. I think it's a great representation of the state. Um, and so I hope that you guys are gaining a lot of feedback from them. Awesome. In invaluable. Um, Leslie and Judge Dolahanty have the honor of testifying on a bill. So that's why they skirted out of here. Uh, so if you want to volunteer to testify for a bill, just you know, get in line. Um, quick wrap ups in the last one minute. Next meeting is April 12th. Uh, need the drafts by April 6th. If you have questions for Dr. Barnes, he's here. Uh, Mary Kay may fight you at some point in time. Uh, if you want to, if you're a member of the a committee and not involved in a work group and you want to sit in on, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, Leslie and I will be reaching out to uh, the chairs to see if they want to meet collectively. I'm going to reach out uh, to Tracy and Shannon and MK and then Magistrate Foley about buying you lunch or, or coffee or, or breakfast, uh, kind of one on one, one time if, if hopefully you're interested in that. Um, any as we wrap it up, anything that someone has to share, good, bad, or otherwise? I'm just going to channel Leslie and remind everybody that the, it, the reports take a long time to put together and format and finalize, and that's why the draft is due in April, even though the final isn't due until July 1. It's it's to really give time for that feedback from this group and then the, the formatting and the editing and all of that. So 
April. So that's good. That's a good yeah. Leslie impression. So, um, <laughs> Julie, we can't thank you enough for your service on the Children's Commission and, and your service in so many different capacities. We're excited about your new job. We hope we cross paths with you. <laughs> Julie was describing the location of, of her office, and it's she said it was nondescript. So I'm concerned that she's going to work for the CIA, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. Uh, CIA, Lily Endowment, maybe maybe that's, you know, I don't know. But we we uh, will miss you, and, and I can't think of a better way to end this meeting um, than to give you a round of applause. <laughs> If it doesn't work out, come back, please. Okay. Thank you. We're adjourned. All right. Anytime you want. Okay. Judge Lloyd, any?